every song we could ever sing. We're worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one. I'm beside you Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love To all around me Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
Father of kindness.
Good morning, Fountain Gate Online. Well, it's been a week. Uh, little did we know uh, this time last week that many of you would be uh, without power and even water for a short time, uh, some for quite a, quite a long time. Uh, yet through it all, man, it's been amazing to watch uh, the love of the body of Christ and others that have just uh, come to the aid of those that were in need. You really see the best in humanity, sometimes the worst, but most of the time the best in humanity when we go through these kinds of crises. My goodness, we made national news. <laughs> uh, Texas, all of Texas was hard hit by this storm. I'm, so I'm so glad we're thawing out and things are better. Uh, and I'm excited to be with you this morning. We're into part three of our series, The Principle of Multiplication. Uh, of the blessed life, the, the title of the message is The Principle of Multiplication. Um, this probably, of the four messages that Robert Morris preaches, um, is probably my favorite because his stories are so amazing. Um, 
you'll be amazed at the truths that you're going to hear this morning. And I love this about Gateway Church and Pastor Robert Morris, um, that they put their money where their mouth is. We didn't know even if we could uh, preview or show this video to you today online for copyright reasons. Uh, We checked with Gateway Church, and they said, by all means, please do. And uh, not everybody's that way. And it really speaks to the heart of Pastor Robert and his great church to be so giving to make sure that we all get this revelation on living the blessed life. And so part three, first week, was awesome. Uh, We learned it's first things first, making sure that we bring our first fruits to the Lord. Last week, we talked about breaking the spirit of mammon. I preached both those sermons, but this was so impactful to me, I wanted you to see the video. So here's the deal. You can get uh, our app. You can go online, download our app. I'm not sure what device you're watching this from, but you'll be able to access this insert, these notes to follow along. There's some fill in the blanks, and I really want you to grab that. Uh, the same for next week. If you haven't downloaded our app, uh, man, just do. It's so simple. Just search Fountain Gate Fellowship. It'll show you where to go, show you how to download it, uh, and then you'll be able to access the these notes. So here's the deal. Let's, let's open our hearts to what the Lord wants to say in these few moments. In the next few moments, you'll be amazed at the things you're going to learn this morning. Let me pray over you, and then we'll get started. Father, thank you for Pastor Robert. Thank you for Gateway. We just want to speak a blessing over them to be so giving uh, to not make an issue over copyright infringements. And Lord, we thank you for just being able to allow to being being allowed to show this today. I thank you for opening spiritual eyes and spiritual ears. Lord, let there be a revelation. Let this be an impartation. More than just gaining information, let there be an impartation. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll be back at the end of the video. This is the last message in the series, The Blessed Life, and this is such an important message that we have to catch it. It's called the principles of multiplication. Now, um, I'm a numbers guy. Uh, Some of you are numbers people, male or female, you can be a numbers person. Uh, I catch numbers all the time. I see numbers, I think in numbers. My wife knows this. Uh, I've tried to say to her, please uh, don't talk to me about something if it involves a number without telling me the number first, because I can't hear you until you say the number. Uh, You know, she says, I want to remodel this part of the house, and I want to do this, and I want to put up new drapes, and I want to get new... Okay, it is like listening to Charlie Brown's parents. (laughs) It is like, what, 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 what. $4,000. Okay, I heard that. I got that. $4,000, you know. So, so my point is, multiplication is a mathematical term. Would it be all right with you if God multiplied your resources? Would that be all right with you? Okay. We've seen other mathematical terms. You know, we've seen addition, praise the Lord. We've seen subtraction. We've seen division. (laughs) sometimes, but what about multiplication? So, Luke chapter 9 and uh, verse 12, all right? Luke 9 verse 12. It says, when the day began to wear away, the 12, there's the number, came and said to him, send the multitude away that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions, for we are in a deserted place here. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said, well, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. Now, let me stop just for a moment and and share something with you. Uh, In Jewish culture at this time, the way they counted crowds was that they counted the heads of households. They counted families. It says there were 5,000 men. As a matter of fact, the uh, account of this in Matthew says it this way. Matthew 14, 21 says, Now those who had eaten were 5,000 men besides women and children. So if you include spouses, and if you think of uh, maybe just an average of two children per family, that would be 20,000 people. Uh, And and at that time, there were probably the the average um, for children for a household would probably be more than two. 
So there could have been 20 or 25,000 people here. So when you see the, the heading in your Bible, the feeding of the 5,000, I don't mind that heading as long as you understand this was 5,000 families. Most theologians believe this is the largest crowd Jesus ever spoke to, ever. So there's 20, 25,000 people here, all right? Now go back to verse 14. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. There's another number. And they did so, and they made them all sit down. And then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them, and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate and were filled, and 12, notice that, 12 baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up by them. Now see, that number really jumped out to me because I thought, why in the world would there still be leftovers? I mean, Jesus knew how many people were there, and there were 12 baskets left over. So, you know, just kind of using my own thinking, I thought, well, you know, I, I guess, I think the reason there were 12 is because Jesus wanted each disciple to have a doggy bag. I mean, that's just, you know, that's what I think. So, okay. So, here's what I like to do with stories in the Bible. And if you've never done this, this is a blast to do. I like to put myself in the story. And I like to think, how would I have responded had I been there that day? So, that's what I want us to do. I want us to all imagine. I want us to use your, your holy imagination. And I want you to put yourself in the story. I want you to imagine that you are one of the disciples and that you are on the Messiah search committee. And uh, you've got a great candidate. I mean, he's healing the sick, raising the dead, walking on water. I mean, this guy's incredible, you know. And so, you have a high attendance Sunday and you uh, send out a mass email, and you tweet about it, you know, and uh, the largest crowd you've ever had attends. I mean, it's absolutely incredible, you know, and you have some really good worship like we did today, and then the guest speaker gets up to speak, and uh, 12 o'clock, he's still going. You think, well, that's that's not too bad, you know. One o'clock, though, he's still going. Two o'clock, I mean, you've already missed the first game, Three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock. I'm, I'm not exaggerating the text. Look at verse 12. It says, when the day began to wear away. You know what that means in the Greek? In the Greek, that means when the day began to wear away. <laughs> I'm sorry, getting late. So again, just using my holy imagination, you know what I think? I think the disciples formed a little committee. I think they got together and they said, man, what are we going to do? I mean, this guy's good, but no one's this good. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, he's just going on and on and on. And I'll tell you what, if I don't get something to eat soon, I'm going to die. I'm going to die right here. I will die if I don't eat soon. And I think one of them said something like, that's it. And they said, what, what, what's it? Let's tell Jesus that the people are getting hungry. <laughs> yeah? He seems to care a lot about the people. He doesn't seem to care much about us, but he seems to care a lot about the people. So now let's imagine that you get elected the spokesperson, okay? So I want you to see this in your mind. Jesus is up there speaking, great big crowd, and you walk up to Jesus. This is the inference from Scripture that they approached him while he was speaking, okay? So you say, um, or, excuse me, excuse, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, uh, Lord, this has been so good today. I tell you, this has really been good. Uh, this series of messages that you're bringing all in one day. Um, <clears throat> but uh, we, we, we were talking and we feel like that the people are getting hungry. Now, we could go all night. I tell you, it's been that good. Uh, but um, so, and it's getting late and the restaurants are about to close. And... Um, we feel like that you should just wrap it up, and, um, and you, can, you can continue this series next week. And the Lord said, uh, you, you feel like the people are hungry. Yes, Lord, it's all about the people. It's all about, it's all about the people. And then he said, look at this, verse 13, maybe you've never seen this, but he said to them, well, then you give them something to eat. Excuse me.
Yeah, yeah, you and your little group over there, you're concerned about the people. Why don't you guys give them something neat? Okay. It, it didn't go like you planned, did it? And so now you got to report back to the committee. That's the hard part. So you go back over and they say, well, did you tell them the people are hungry? Yes, I did. I said those exact words. I said the people are hungry. Well, is he going to dismiss the service? Well, what did he say? He said for us to give him something to eat. <laughs> what? He said for us to give him something to eat. What? 20,000 people here? Oh, man, we're dead. Just wait till the first church of the Pharisees hears about this. You know? <laughs> oh. And then one of them said, man, I, there's, just, there's just no way. And then there's some little kid that was walking by that snuck back into town during the message, and he walk, he's walking by with a long John Silver sack. And so they grab it, you know, and they open it up. He got the two-piece meal with extra rolls. <laughs> and of course, Peter probably just grabbed one. Oh, stop it, Peter. Stop it. That's all we have. That's all we have. And then one of them said, that's it. And they said, what's it? Let's tell Jesus this is all we have. And then he'll dismiss the service. Now, I want you to think about something. If you had never read this in the Bible and you had been there that day, wouldn't you think, if you said that's all you had, that he dismissed? Wouldn't you think that? Doesn't that make sense? Okay, so, again, you're the spokesperson. Just, just one more, just one more. Um, you, you know, a moment ago we were talking, I was telling you how good this is. And um, um, you said for us to, you know, um, give them something to eat. And uh, we've been working on that. And, um, but um, all we have is um, a two, two pieces of fish and um, five, um, almost five, Peter ate some, Lord, and uh, I, I couldn't stop him, um, um, but uh, five rolls, but, but that, that's, that's all we have. So we're thinking we should just go with the original idea and just, you know, wrap it up. And the Lord said, okay, let me get this straight. You have two pieces of fish and, well, almost five, I, I know how Peter is, five rolls and... Um, that's all you have, right? Yes, that's, that's all we have. Yep, yep, that'd be great. Have them sit down in groups of 50. Excuse me? <laughs> um, oh, oh, Lord, uh, we don't have a lot of these snack packs, Lord. Um, there, there was a kid walk. Peter took it from him. I didn't take it from him, Lord. <laughs> yep, yep, that'd be fine. Have them sit down in groups of 50. Now, have you ever thought about this? Getting 20,000 people to sit down in groups of 50. Now, I, I, I don't know about you, but ha have you ever worked with people? <laughs> I mean, people are hard to work with, aren't they? So they're getting them all set down. And then I, I think personally, I think that the disciples figured it out. I do. I think one of them said, hey, you remember that story in the Bible where Elisha fed 100 men with 12 loaves of bread? I'll bet you when he prays over it, it's going to multiply right in front of our eyes. I said, yeah. Now, actually, do you know many of us believe that's what happened? But that's not what happened. It's not at all what happened. Matter of fact, verse 16 says, he blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set for the multitude. Now, again, I think probably Peter probably, probably said, hey, give me one of them rolls. Here, here, Lord, here, pray over mine first. Here, pray over mine, pray over mine. Here, pray over mine. So watch, watch, watch. Pray over mine, Lord. And Jesus takes this piece of bread from Peter, lifts it up and says, Father, bless it. Breaks it and hands half of it back to Peter. Uh, are you through praying? <laughs> yes, Peter, it's blessed. Now go give it out. You want to pray some more? <laughs> no, Peter, it's blessed. Now go give it away. Now, personally, I think Peter walked up to the first person and said something like this. Take just a little piece. <laughs> what would you have said? 
So he's going down the road, take a little piece, take a little piece, take a little. I said, little piece, you pig, what is wrong with you? <laughs> take a little piece. Okay, he gets down to the end of the road. There is a crumb left in his hand, sweat pouring down his face, and he looks down at it, and right before the person grabs it, it grows in Peter's hands. And he says, you can have some more. <laughs> Listen, the miracle did not happen in the master's hands. It happened in the disciples' hands. Amen. This is very important. So, from this story, there are two principles of multiplication. If you're taking notes, I want you to write these down. If you're not taking notes, write these down, all right? <laughs> Here's number one. It has to be blessed before it can multiply. It has to be blessed before it can multiply. Think about this. What if the disciples had given the fish and the loaves out without Jesus blessing it? It never would have multiplied. It was the blessing of Jesus that gave it the potential to multiply. There are many, many people who give a little here and give a little there, but they never see their finances multiplied, and the reason is they're not blessed by Jesus, and the Bible tells us very, very clearly that the way Jesus blesses our finances is we give the first 10% to the house of God. And when we give the first 10% to the house of God, the rest is blessed, and the rest multiplies. There's a couple in our church that when I preached on this a few years ago, they came to me and they said, Pastor, we got so convicted because we were giving 5% to Gateway Church and 5% to a missions organization. Nothing wrong with giving to missions organizations, but you don't give the tithe. You give offerings over and above the tithe to missions organizations. And they said, we actually had the check already written. We tore the check up, wrote another check for 10%. And Malachi says, bring the whole tithe into the house of the Lord. They said, we wrote a check for the whole tithe to Gateway Church. And they said, we'd been waiting for a bonus for months that we were supposed to get. And after we gave that on Monday, we got that bonus. And they actually said to us, we felt so bad that it took so long that we uh, gave you more than what you were supposed to get after they gave the whole tithe. So number one, it has to be blessed before it can multiply. Number two, it has to be given away before it can multiply. It has to be given away before it can multiply. Again, think about this story. What if the disciples, after Jesus had blessed it, what if the disciples had eaten it instead of giving it away? And a lot of people do that. They tithe or they give to the local church, but then they don't give over and above. And it has the potential to multiply. It's blessed, but then they don't give offerings over and above. So in my own life, let me tell you how this happened. Um, I, start, I got saved at 19 in Jake's Motel, room 12, and I started sharing my testimony, and then I went to Bible college, and then I started preaching youth revivals and things like this. And in a few years, the Lord said to me, now listen to this statement, it's very important. You might even want to write this down. He said, I want you to get your finances in order so I can bless them. Yet you need to understand something. God cannot, it would be against his nature, God cannot bless something that's not in order. So he said, I want you to get your finances in order so I can bless them. So I said, well, Lord, you, what do you want me to do? He said, three things. And then I, I, I want you, you could write these down as well. I, I, I put them on the uh, screen for you. Number one, he said, get out of debt. Now, every time God speaks something to us, God will clarify what he means. For us, we still operate by this to this day, to getting out of debt was we, we, it was, we had peace about owing for our home because it was an appreciating item and because of the tax credits and things like that. Now, some people don't have peace about that. I understand that. But for us, we had peace about owing for our home, but nothing else. And so, we, the first thing that had to go was our car. We had a car with this big payment. It was actually too big for us. We knew it was. So, we sold that car, and we bought a car for cash for $750. That's all we could afford. But we loved that car. We prayed over it. Uh, we anointed it with oil about a quarter a week. <laughs> and we drove that car. The second thing God said to me was, don't manipulate. Now, by this time again, I'm in ministry, and I'm traveling and speaking in churches. He said, don't manipulate. I said, Lord, what do you mean, don't manipulate? He said, I want you to know that I, I am your source. So he said, from now on, when a pastor asks you, you know, what are your financial requirements for coming? You say, I have no financial requirements for coming. 
Before, they would say, what are your financial requirements? And I would say, well, give, pay our expenses and give us an offering. And my friends would even say, and the offering has to be a minimum of. I never even said that. But he said, from now on, you say, I have no financial requirements for coming. And I'll never forget the first pastor I told that to. Uh, I said, I have no financial requirements. He said, well, that's good because I'm not sure we could even pay your gas. He didn't say pay your expenses. He said, pay your gas. And we got in that $750 car and we started driving to that church and I stopped and filled it up with gas and I went in to pay for it. And this lady said to me, it's taken care of. And I said, what do you mean it's taken care of? She said, well, because I own the gas station and when you pulled in, God told me you were an evangelist and I was to fill your car up with gas. And I went out. I went out and I got in my car and I said, God, I sure like doing it better your way than my way. <laughs> and then a pastor called and he said to me, uh, can you come on this date? And I said, yes. He said, what are your financial requirements for coming? I said, I have no financial requirements for coming. And he just couldn't get it. He said, what, what, what do you mean you have no financial requirements for coming? I said, I mean, I have uh, no financial requirements for coming. <laughs> and he said, what do you mean you have no financial requirements for coming? <laughs> And he just couldn't get it. He said, how are you going to live? How are you going to live? If you come to our church and preach and we don't give you an offering, how are you going to live? And I said something, and I meant it right, but it came out wrong. You ever, you ever do that? And so I, I said to the guy, listen, if we come to your church and preach and you don't give me an offering, I said, God will take care of me and God will take care of you. He said, well, we'll give you an offering. I said, no, I didn't, I didn't mean that. I, I didn't mean that. I said, what, what I meant was God will provide for me and he'll provide for you. Of course, as I've thought about it, <clears throat> it probably works both ways. But anyway, <laughs> so the Lord said, get out of debt, don't manipulate. Number three said, give. And I said, well, Lord, um, I do give. I tithe. Now, listen to what he said. He said, son, giving, tithing is not giving. Tithing is returning. He said, the tithe belongs to me. He said, you only have two choices with the tithe. You bring it to the house of God or you steal it. It's only your only choice, according to Scripture. There's no other choice in Scripture. And so, he's, I said, well, Lord, this, aren't these good questions? I said, well, Lord, how will I know when to give? How will I know what to give? How will I know where to give? Listen to what he said. So simple. Listen, he said, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. See, my sheep hear my voice. So the very next meeting I go to, now this is all, this is, this is it. This is all I do now. Is I, at that time, I travel and spoke at churches. And if they gave us an offering, great. And if they, you know, some churches would give us a love offering. Some churches would give us like offerings. <clears throat> some gave, uh, don't like, don't come back. Anyway, so, so I said, I have no financial requirements. And I went, I had one meeting for the whole month, for the whole month. And it was a Sunday evening meeting, not a whole week. And it was about 60 people. And so I go and I speak, and at the end, the pastor gets up and said, this guy told me something no minister has ever said to me, ever. He said he had no financial requirements to come. He said, I want us to give an offering to him. And so they gave an offering, and he came up to me at the end of the service, and he said, look at this. Look at this. He was excited. We've never done this. He said, look, look how much this offering is. I'm so excited. And I looked down, and it was enough for the whole month. And at this time, I had a staff, and I had an office, and I had expenses. So it was enough, not just for my personal income, but for the ministry's income for the whole month. And I thought, God, you are so good. That's amazing. And I'm standing there talking to the pastor, and I glance over his shoulder, and at the back of the room is a missionary that spoke right before I spoke. And this voice said to me, give him the offering. And I'll never forget what I thought. Here's what I thought. Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> That's not God. <laughs> That's, that's not God. That is not God. That's not you. If you don't know, that's not you. And this voice said, give him the offering. Give him the offering. Give him the offering. And I remember even telling the Lord, I said, Lord, you're not thinking clearly. You, you got all pumped up because I preached a good message and now you want to give. But I see you're not thinking clearly here. And the Lord said, I told you I'd tell you. I told you I'd tell you where to give, when to give and how much to give. And I'm telling you to give him the offering. So I went up to the missionary when no one else was looking. I made sure no one saw me. And I endorsed the check and I folded it in half and I said, I'm gonna give you something on two conditions. Number one, you don't look at it until after you leave because it was a very, very large check. Number two, I said, you never ever tell anyone I gave this to you, never. And I gave him the check 
And we walked out to our car, Debbie and I, and there were some people standing there talking. They said, hey, would y'all like to go get some pizza? And we said, yeah, you know, because we were, we were broke. And so we said, yeah, we, yeah, sure, we'd love to. And so we went to pizza, and there were five other couples, six couples total, Debbie and I, and five other couples. And the six ladies sat on one end of the table, and the six guys sat on one end of the table. And I was on this end, Debbie was down on the other end. And all of a sudden, these four guys got to talking. And this guy across the table from me leaned over like that. And so, you know, I kind of lean over. I don't know what he's about to say, you know. <laughs> and all of a sudden, he just said to me, how much was the love offering? And so I told him, and it was an offering, not an honorarium. The difference is an honorarium is a round amount with zeros, like $500 or $1,000 or something. This was an offering, so it had dollars and cents. And so I told him every number, I told him the exact amount of it, and he shook his head like this, and then he said, where's the check? Like that. And, and I know you're supposed to tell the truth, but I didn't want to say we gave it to a missionary. I didn't want to do that, and I didn't want to manipulate, and I didn't know why this guy was asking me. I didn't know who he was, and I was flustered, and so I just kind of heard myself say, Debbie has it. <laughs> and so he said to me, go get it. I want to see it. So I said, okay. So I got up and I walked down where Debbie was and I just kind of whispered in her ear, you know, I said, how's your pizza? Good. Okay. There, what else do you say? There's no chat, you know? So I come back and again, I'm flustered and I don't, you know, and so I just, I said, it's in the car. And he said, it's not in the car. So I said, where is it? I mean, you know, you, you know so much, pal. And he said to me, you gave it away, didn't you? And I said, how, did you, how do you know that? And he said, because God told me. And he reached in his pocket and he pulled out a check that he had written before the service that night. And he opened it up and it was made out to our ministry. And remember, our, the check I gave away had dollars and cents. He opened it up and it was exactly... 10 times the amount of the check I'd just given away. Exactly, exactly. And he said, here, take this. And he's holding the top of it, and I reached out and I took the bottom of it, but he wouldn't let it go. <laughs> and I realized he wanted to say something to me. I know now there was an impartation from a person who had the gift of giving, but he's holding the top, I'm holding the bottom, and I looked right across the top of that check, right into his eyes, and he said, God's about to teach you about giving so you can teach the body of Christ. And he let the check go. And when he did, this revelation came on me. This is God's money. And every penny I get is God's money. And so I said to Debbie, this is God's money. We need to ask God what he wants us to do. Listen to me. Every believer needs that revelation about every check we get. This is God's money. God, what do you want me to do with it? And so we said, Lord, what do you want us to do with this? And the Lord told us to buy a car for a single mom. You know, we do a lot for single moms day. This started 25 years ago in my life. He said, buy a car for a single mom. We still had the $750 car. We didn't go ourselves, buy ourselves a new car. We bought a car for a single mom. Then the Lord see, said, see that guy over, it's out of work. You pay his salary until he gets another job. That was thousands of dollars a month. We started giving so extravagantly, and we never said a word. I didn't have a mailing list. I didn't tell people what I was doing. I didn't ask for money. I didn't stand up in the pulpit and tell any of these stories. Never told a one of these back then. And God just began to provide from all over. I remember standing on the front row, and a guy walking up, and he stuck a check in my pocket, and he said to me, God's teaching you about giving. And he turned around and walked off, and I opened the check up. It's $5,000. It was just amazing. This was back in the 80s, it, what God was doing. I remember one time God said to me, I want you to sell your van. By this time, this was two or three years down the road, and we had a really nice van that we traveled in. We traveled every week and spoke in church. As a matter of fact, our son was three years old, Josh, and uh, someone came up to him after church and said, where do you live? He said, in the van. You know, so, <laughs> so the Lord said to me, I want you to sell your van. I said, well, God, how much you want me to sell it for? He said, $12,000. So I said, okay. So I, the next day, this is on a Saturday. On Sunday, I'm in church. I'm worshiping God. This guy walks up to me in church and says to me, hey, you want to sell your band? <laughs> like that. And I said, 
uh, yeah, I do. He said, 12,000. I said, yeah. He pulls his checkbook out. He writes me a check right then, hands it to me, takes my keys. We had to get a ride home from church. <laughs> Took the van just like that. This was on a Monday. I now know why he wrote me the check that day, because on Monday, we got on a plane. We fly to Costa Rica. The missionary picks us up in a missionary vehicle. You ever been in one of those? I'm, we're bouncing all over the place, you know. There's a hole in the floor where the muffler is, and the exhaust is coming up. I'm about to die. The exhaust is coming up through the floor. And I said to this missionary, why don't you get you a new van? He said, I'm about to. Last week, I was driving by this car lot, and God spoke to me to stop and went over and said, I'm going to give you this van and showed me a van. I said to him, how much is it? <laughs> you want to take a guess? <laughs> he said, 12,000. I said, turn around. Let's go get the van. Listen to me. This is fun. This is fun to live life this way. And then one day, the Lord spoke to me. I was having my quiet time, and the Lord said to me, would you give me everything? Would you give me everything? And I knew immediately he meant everything in our checking account, everything in our savings account, everything in the ministry checking account, everything in the ministry savings account, our retirement, both our vehicles, and our house. And we gave our house to a pastor that had five children, didn't have a house. Hear me. Listen. I know I, I, when I say this, about Debbie and I giving everything. And we've given, we feel like we've given everything three times. When I say everything, I mean everything God asked for. Listen to me. Because the other time, the second time God asked us for everything, he said, don't give your cars in your house. Give me everything you have. And that was including our retirement. We gave that to buy that first piece of property, Gateway Church Mall. We gave everything we had. And then another time, God spoke to me to give everything. And it wasn't the retirement, but it was every, all the cash we had. So please hear me. When I say that, when I tell you something like that, I am not asking you to give everything. Listen, I am asking you to give everything God says. I am asking you to do that, okay? Just what God tells you to do. So anyway, we sat down, Debbie and I, and we talked about where to give everything and all, and we, we you know, divvied. It took us several months to do this, by the way, to distribute everything. And the next day, I'm having my quiet time, and I was adding it up in my mind, you know, because that was a lot of money. And I was adding up, and the Lord said to me, what are you doing? I said, nothing. Because you, you know, if you don't tell him what you're thinking, he doesn't know. <laughs> and the Lord said, no, what are you thinking? And I was having this thought, and it wasn't really a spiritual thought. So I said, Lord, I, I, I don't want to tell you what I'm thinking. And he said, no, tell me what you're thinking. I said, well, I said, you know that old saying, you can't outgive God? He said, yeah, I've heard that. I said, well, I think I did. I said, I mean, don't feel bad, you know, and all, but, you know, but um, I said, this time, I think I've got you. I'll never, I don't know why I use that term. I said, I think I've got you. And he, look, he said so clearly, you think you've got me? And the phone rang. And I picked up the phone, and this guy on the other end of the phone said, Robert, God told me to help you with your transportation. Here's what I thought. He's going to give us a car. And, and that's good, because, you know, we don't have a car, and, you know, but Lord, even if he gives us a car, I just gave away everything I owned and two cars. And at that time, we'd given nine cars away, nine. So I thought, even if he gives this car, thank you, but I still got you. And I said, well, what'd the Lord tell you to do? He said, he told me to buy you an airplane and I'm going to pay for the gas. I'm going to pay for the hangar, the insurance, the maintenance, and I've hired a pilot and I'm going to pay his salary. Here's his name and number. You just call him and tell him where you want to go and when you want to go. And the Lord said, gotcha. Gotcha. Now, now listen to me. This, this is not a message given you get an airplane. Okay, listen. Because the airplane's not the best part of the story. Here's the best part of the story. The next day I'm having my quiet time and I'm reading about Solomon, the most famous story about Solomon. You remember what God said to Solomon? Absolutely amazing. Can you imagine God saying this to you? He said, ask. Ask anything you want and I'll give it to you. Can you imagine God saying that to you? And I'm reading that story and I thought to myself, I wonder what happened right before God said that to Solomon. I wonder if Solomon did anything. I wonder what he did that day. And I went back and studied it, and that day he was inaugurated the king of Israel. 
it was tradition for the king to sacrifice one bull. Do you know how many Solomon sacrificed? One thousand bulls. Not ten, not a hundred, a thousand bulls. And the Lord spoke to me and said, I only say to extravagant givers, ask anything you want. He said, I would never say that to a selfish person because I can't trust selfish people. I can trust givers, so. And I'm not even thinking two days forward, we've given everything we have. I'm not even thinking that. I'm just having my quiet time. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit said to me, ask. Ask anything you want. And I knew immediately what I wanted because you have to remember that I have a very immoral past. And I had believed the lie that my marriage wouldn't last. And I said, God, I want for Debbie and I to be passionately in love all the days of our lives. I don't want to lose my marriage. And this past May, we had our 31st wedding anniversary. That's better than an airplane. It's better than an airplane. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I want you to live the blessed life. I want every member of Gateway Church and every person watching to live this happy life. And I want to know, what is God saying to you today? Some of you have struggled for years to tithe, to give the whole tithe to the house of God, the first 10% of your gross income, undesignated. I'm, I'm, I'm pleading with you. Step out in faith. You may have to sell something like Debbie and I had to. You may have to lower your standard of living, but you will never, ever regret it. Some of you, God is speaking to you to give extravagantly again. Some of you are great givers, but you've backed off because of this financial recession. And you think, this is not a good time to give. Listen, it's always a good time to obey God. I'm not asking you to do anything. You know me as your pastor. I'm not asking you to do anything that God is not asking you to do. But if God is asking you to do it, and some of you, He is, and it's a step of faith, I'm asking you to do what God tells you to do. But some of you, God is asking you to give Him the most extravagant gift you could ever give Him. And now listen to me closely. I am not talking about money. I'm talking about your heart. God is asking you, will you give me your life? Will you give me your life? And you- Man, what a, what a powerful, powerful word. So many truths. I've seen this video several times and even again. I was able to glean some truths from it. But I want to just stay in this moment of prayer and posture ourselves just for a few more moments before the Lord. And 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 just as Pastor Robert made clear that there may be some watching this video that that does not know Christ or has never asked Christ into your heart. And we want to give you that opportunity this morning. And so if you just bow your heads with me as we just kind of stay in this kind of spirit of prayer. And pray a very simple prayer to commit your life. He gave, he gave you his very best. The Father gave you his very best. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And very simply, whoever believes him should not perish but have everlasting life. Would you be willing today to give him your very best? In fact, give him your life. See, to live the blessed life means it starts by acknowledging Jesus as Lord and Savior and committing your life to him and becoming his disciple. So would you just very simply, if that's you, would you pray this prayer after me? Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus, for giving me your very best. So today, I want to give my life my very best back to you. I ask you today to forgive me my sins, 
come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. I want to serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you prayed that prayer, again, we have moderators that are watching this message each week. We say this, but we're serious. We want to know. Man, it, it, just in the comment section, just let us know. Give us your number so that we can contact you and get some very important information to you. And I just am believing uh, that this is the, the beginning, really, now of the rest of your life. You've been born again. You've been reborn. You get, you get to re-up. You get to reset. How cool is that? And so I'm excited for you today, for those that prayed this prayer. And I'm excited for those of you that were able to receive this impartation, this powerful preaching and message on the principle of multiplication. So many revelational truths that I believe if we'll follow by them and if we'll adhere to these principles, we'll begin to live a life that we never thought we could live. And it's not so that we could just have we're blessed, remember, so that we can be a blessing. It's pay it forward. And we get to live a life that people would be so envious of and that would dream of because of our faithfulness to God. So I trust this has blessed you today. Can't wait till next week. We're going to wrap it up, our final week. Um, we're going to talk about the Ten Commandments of Living the Blessed Life. Uh, Pastor Robert, we're going we're gonna to show that video. I know it will bless you. It's going to blow you away. It's so good. You don't want to miss next week either. I hope you have a great week. Hey, the sun's going to be out. Snow's going to melt off. We're going to look up. It's going to be springtime before we know it. So get outside. Enjoy yourself today. God bless. Have a wonderful week. Now, if you have raised your hand today, if you've given your life to the Lord, it is so simple to do that by clicking the raise your hand button. We're going to get some information to you, and then you guys can chat with us and we're going to tell you about your next steps. Now, if you're on Facebook, all you have to do is private message us, and we can do the same thing. So if you gave your life to the Lord today, be sure to reach out to us. And if you'd like to give to further this reach, this digital reach for the online campus and get the gospel all over the world, you can do that by simply going to fgfchurch give, and you can follow the directions there, and it'll tell you several different ways that you can give. If you'd like to watch rebroadcast, those happen on Facebook at 3, 6, 9, and 11. And then in the middle of the week, I'd love to meet with you at 6 o'clock for our Midweek Connect here on Facebook. So take care this week, and we'll see you either Wednesday at 6 with me or next weekend at 11 a.m. Take care.